Hi, my name is Steve Walker from Promise Money, and today I'm going to talk about development finance. We get lots of queries, uh, and I see them online and on forums as well, from uh, sometimes brokers, but more often from property investors or landlords who are getting into the sector. They say, well, what is development finance? How does it work? How do we put it together? So this is a bit of a whistle-stop tour, just to give you a bit of a flavour for how it all works. Um, so development finance is typically, typically going to be used for a ground-up development. Um, so we have a plot, we have planning consent, but we've got nothing much else. Um, or it could be used um, for a conversion, for a heavy refurb or conversion from, let's say, offices through to um, residential. Um, and in some cases, uh, the finance might be needed to, f to, um, to cover the costs of the purchase and the build. In some cases, um, somebody may already own the plot and they just need to cover the build costs. Um, but there are three magic numbers in development finance uh, and those are um, what's the purchase price or the value now, what's the build costs and what will it be worth when it's finished and whether it's residential um, or it's offices or whatever it is those are going to be magic numbers and typically um, lenders will lend up to 70% of the purchase price or value at day one, up to 100% of build costs and up to 75% of the gross development value, i.e. the GDV, what it will be worth when it's finished. But those are sort of really getting the towards the maximum figures. So for less experienced developers, then the numbers may be less than that. It might be 60 or 65% of purchase price. And, it and so, so the numbers will change depending on the development and who the applicant is and the, and the whole structure of the deal. But that gives you a bit of a flavor for it. Um, so lenders are going to be looking for developers who've got experience, generally speaking. They don't want to lend to somebody who's a first-timer um, because they are reliant on the project being successful for them to get their money back. The last thing they want to be left with is a project which fails halfway through uh, and then they've got to dispose of it because a, a half-completed project has a very limited market. So they're, they're really going to guard against that. So experience is important but there are lenders who will deal with inexperienced or less experienced developers. Um, they're also going to be looking for the project to be profitable. So if, you, if, if a developer comes along and says, right, I've got this great project, I'm going to, um, I'm, I'm going to buy it at 100,000 pounds, I'm going to spend 100,000 pounds, and it's going to be worth 300,000 pounds, they go, right, okay, that sounds about right. One third, one third, one third. We like the sound of that. But if he says, it's going, I'm going to buy it £100,000, I'm going to spend 100000 and it's going to be worth 225 well, there's not a lot of margin in that, especially when you then factor in the cost of finance. And most development lenders are going to say, no, that's not one for us. Now, as a property investor, you might be saying, well, actually, it's a great deal because I'm not looking for capital appreciation. I'm actually looking to convert from, uh, from residential to an HMO, and my rental yield is going to be massive. But for a development lender, no, they're not going to be too keen on that because if it does go wrong, the numbers are too tight for them to be able to get out. So think about that one third, one third, one third, one third to buy it, one third to build it, and one third for profit to include your, your finance costs. That's what they like to see. Um, so um, moving on from that, we've then got different types of development. So there's plenty of lenders out there who are looking for the large developments. You know, you're looking to borrow four, four to five hundred thousand pounds minimum, up to 10, 20 million pounds. They like the big chunky developments. Plenty of those. Um, but then we get the smaller developments, and occasionally these come along where somebody's found one plot. They're going to want to do one house, uh, and there are less lenders for that. But they will lend from circa forty thousand pounds upwards for small developments. But because there are less lenders you're going to be looking at slightly higher rates of interest. And then what we're also seeing quite a bit of at the moment is regulated developments. And this is a scenario where um, you, may, uh, you, you may have a plot in your back garden. You haven't split it off. It's all part of your current home um, and you're looking to build a, build a house in the back garden. Well, because you live there, that makes this a regulated development. And there are very few lenders who will do regulated developments, but they are out there. So if you do want to build a plot in your back garden, again, minimum, minimum loans around about £40,000, but you are looking at higher rates, and I'll come on to rates in a little while. Um, but first, I just want to bring some of the numbers to reality. So let's look at a couple of examples. 
So let's take a scenario where we have a purchase price of £200,000. That could be for the plot or it could be for a building which is going to be developed. Um, and typically, although you, you might get a little bit more than this, typically lenders will lend round about 65% of the purchase price. So that's £130,000 at day one. But what they're also going to do is lend the interest on that £130,000 from within that amount. And they're going to lend their fees. So it's not as simple as just getting £130,000. That's £130,000 and that's gross. Okay, once you take the interest out of that, and that will vary depending on the term of the loan and the fees out, you could easily be down to £110,000, quite easily. So you need to work that out. Don't just think you can get 65% at day one because the interest and the fees have got to come out of that. Just the same as with a bridging loan. Um, then we've got the build costs. So when the build costs come in, um, you've bought the property, you're going to be expected to do some work on it and it might be let's take a let's take a, a, a greenfield site um, and let's say you get the footings in at the point you've got the footings in you're going to be saying to the lender right I need some more cash and at that point they'll say yep that's fine you've told us it's going to cost you 200,000 pounds to build you need 50,000 pounds now that's fine we'll now advance you the 50,000 pounds um, and that will incur interest from that point onwards now the interest normally on the tranches that you borrow thereafter are added onto the loan as long and they'll have already done their maths to work out that once they add the interest on it's still going to be within their maximum um, percentage of the gross development value because they won't want to lend gross lending more than 75% of the GDV. Keep gross lending and net lending in your mind because gross is the total amount, net is after fees and after interest. So. You've now got another £50,000 that, that, that's been advanced to you, but the lender's going to be mindful that the property has gone up a, a little bit in value because if they lend you another £50,000 on top of the 130 and the property hasn't gone up in value by virtue of the work that you've done, then they're getting a little bit exposed. So you just need to be mindful of that. So it's normal that each time that a tranche is released to you, the property will have gone up in value by some degree. And it's also quite normal that um, the development lender is going to want to check on the progress of your work. They're not just going to say here's £130,000 and we'll lend you £200,000 over in four stages whenever you want it without checking that the building is going the right direction because if it's not going the right direction they are left with a problem if the development fails, if you fail. So what they'll often do is uh, send a surveyor back just to check on the progress on the, of the work or if it's a fairly straightforward type of development they may well just work on um, uh, vid a video or a zoom call or something like that to have a look at it but if they're sending surveyors back there will be costs involved in that so you just need to be aware of that too each time a surveyor goes back and typically there could be between four and five tranches on a normal residential development if we're talking about a housing estate, then it's, it's a different game, but the, the principles are still the same. So over a period of time, um, you've borrowed your you've borrowed your hundred and thirty thousand pounds towards your purchase price, and uh, you've also borrowed. Let's keep the colours right. Let's say sixty five percent of the build costs, which is another hundred and thirty thousand pounds. Now, as I said, typically you're going to get most of that net in your hand to use because um, because they'll they will add on the interest on that hundred and thirty thousand pounds to the loan at the end okay so you'll get far less in the first tranche you should get more in the second tranche and at the end of it uh, you've done all the work and you've you've achieved your gross development value your GDV your end value of six hundred thousand pounds and at that point you're going to be looking to either sell the property or refinance the property. Okay. Now, the other thing to bear in mind, of course, is you've got to make sure that you're, you're going to be able to do that, if it's, especially if it's a refinance. So when you start your development finance journey, you need to be looking at it with the end in mind and thinking, right, can I raise the finance to get out of this? 
and during the COVID period a lot of people got caught out by that one because uh, the development took longer than they thought it would be so instead of being a 12 month deal it was an 18 month deal uh, which means there's more interest um, but also um, because a lot of lenders withdrew during the COVID period and weren't doing development exits quite as willingly as they were previously uh, so just think about what's my exit going to be and of course you need to talk to a broker about that and say right if I build this property it's going to look like this these are the rental yields that I think I'm going to get for it assuming it's going to be a, rent, a, a rental investment um, what sort of exit what sort of deal can you get me and, and, and that's often going to be um, governed by the LTVs um, so again the developer is going to be thinking well we don't want to go more than 75 percent of the GDV because you might not be able to exit and it's important that you do exit um, they want you to have a successful development so let's just talk a little bit about interest rates well interest rates I would say a typical rate on a normal sort of resi type development um, multiple units that sort of thing is probably 0.85 percent but um, you will see rates down as low as 0.65 percent and for something which is um, more quirky let's say it's first time development it's not everybody's cup of tea we're down to one or two lenders available you could be looking at 1.2 or even 1.5 percent per month okay so uh, these are monthly rates lender fees typically you're going to be looking at two percent um, and term typically you're going to be looking at 12 to 18 months now i would i would expect that most people watching this video will be property investors um, who are looking to do smaller developments you know somewhere from 200,000 to a million pounds something like that um, rather than building a, a, a massive uh, hotel complex or housing estate um, and all I'd say to you is look development finance it's not the cheapest it's not the cheapest so have a good think about what you can do to minimize the costs of your development finance so if you have other property be it your main residence or um, other buy to lets explore a remortgage explore a second charge loan to see if you can raise money there which may cost you less than development finance okay and if you if you've got more cash that you can put into the deal from elsewhere it's going to make your development finance easier uh, and it could mean that um, you can borrow uh, part of the purchase price from elsewhere um, so you're just borrowing the build costs and if you're only borrowing the build costs the LTVs come right down for the development lender and they're going to be a little bit more relaxed and there's going to be a little bit more choice for you and you might not get into as many site visits uh, and the costs of, the, of those sorts of things another consideration is um, secured overdrafts again as a homeowner or as a buy to let landlord there are overdraft facilities secured loans second charge overdraft facilities which you can take on which are, are ideal for property investors um, because you get a facility uh, and let's say you've got a hundred thousand pound or a two hundred thousand pound facility secured on your property um, and you can borrow from that facility and uh, take money out and pay it back as it suits you so it just gives you that flexibility to maybe cover part of your build cost or your purchase price um, with a cheaper a cheaper facility uh, which is flexible that's the important thing it's flexible a remortgage and a second charge isn't designed a normal second charge isn't designed for you to borrow and then put the money back and then borrow again whereas the overdraft facility is so uh, yes you can flex it up and down um, draw down pay back without penalty and only pay interest on the money that you're borrowing at the time and then the other consideration is bridging you might th you might have another property a buy to let somewhere and you might say uh, or oh, you may residence again you might think right if I take a bridging loan out on that property I can use the bridging loan to fund the purchase and then I am only looking to borrow development finance for the build costs and again that might give you more flexibility about which lenders will do it for you and what rates you get on your development finance so there's a lot to think about it's not straightforward um, always talk to a decent broker about about your plans um, and make sure you've thought them through now there's one thing I should say right at the end is if you haven't got planning it isn't really a development deal because any planning lender is going to say uh, this isn't th this hasn't got a clear exit because what happens if you don't get planning 
even if you even if you say well it's 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 a, it's a dead cert I'm going to get it because you haven't got it so most development lenders are going to say we're not interested until you have got planning to do what it is you're planning to do um, so get planning first because that's going to make life a whole lot easier if you haven't got planning and this does happen you know we see an awful lot of um, investors come to us and say right I'm going to buy that property um, I'm going to get planning on it and then I'm going to develop it well don't use development money to to buy that property it's going to be it's going to be two separate transactions you're going to either have to use funds from your remortgage from a second charge or a bridging loan to buy the property and then development will come on later once you've got the planning uh, hope I haven't confused you hope that's been helpful um, so uh, please uh, subscribe to our other videos have a look at what, what what we're all about there's lots of useful information on there about all sorts of different products uh, and um, also please subscribe to newsletters and emails that we send out and you'll find a link somewhere at the bottom of this this video um, so thanks very much and talk to you again soon bye bye